Hello there, I'm Gloria Makarenko. Well, things are starting to look up in BC. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is Our Vancouver. Coming up, learn how a Vietnamese family's recipe for dumplings is tied to their story of migration to Vancouver and how the owner of a bowling alley that's going under hopes it will lift her community spirits when it finds new life as a church. But first, check out this clip. Bruce, you haven't been Batman for two years yet. You don't need to sacrifice your body for Gotham. Ever since you got shot by that lunatic, I, I felt like I should have protected you. I swore when I was ready to return to Gotham I wouldn't let anything happen to you, the people here. You're a 23-year-old billionaire. You should be out partying, not dressing up and beating on criminals. That's my dad's job. And where was he when you got shot? I have to be the city's protector. There are some things the police can't do. Well, no, that is not Robert Pattinson from the upcoming movie, The Batman. That is from The Rise of the Bat. It's a short fan film directed by our next guest. Ashvin Dale is a 21-year-old filmmaker in Surrey. Ashvin, hello there. How's it going? It's going very well. This must be an interesting time for you. I mean, you've been getting a lot of attention for this film. How did it all come about? Honestly, it, uh, it first started off just being uh, me, and a, me and a co-worker. We wanted to see who could create the, the better Batman film and Right before we were about to start shooting, we thought, you know, let's do this together and actually make a big production out of it. And so we called up um, all the all of our actors and like we we found real like real talent out there. And um, yeah, we put this thing together. <laughs> I want to hear more about that. Not everybody's got a lot of top talent um, on their you know, on their files or in their, you know, in their contacts, that type of thing. But I mean, equipment, people, I mean, how much time and energy did you put into putting this all together? Um, so it, I guess we, it started late last year, around uh, November-ish. We started writing the script and the script took us about a month or two months. And honestly, I didn't think it was going to take that long because it was just the amount of rewrites we were doing and... Um, it's just like just trying to like get the script up to par and like make it the best it could be and then for the actors we we entered we looked at this website that you could just put a post up and we honestly thought we weren't going to get that much uh that many people auditioning but the like it was overwhelming the amount of people that wanted to be a part of this production <laughs> it must have surprised you what why do you think that is what were they I mean, what were they telling you about why they were interested in taking part well, I mean, because this was during the pandemic, right? So a lot of a lot of actors were wa just wanted to get um, uh, get back into it, and, like just like keep keep uh, keep acting. And a lot of like a lot of the people that we we did hire uh, are big Batman films. So it's just like you know, it was it was, it was fun to do uh, with people that love what uh, love the the Batman name and the production. Yeah. Okay. So you already had that going for you, but then there have been so many different takes on Batman and the Batman story over the years, right? So how would you describe yeah. your take? So yeah, like you said, there's a lot of other Batman um, recarnations, but the, the one thing that I feel is different from my Batman than all the other ones is all the other ones have always seen Batman as this, as this tough, unbeatable, you know, this like person that can never lose. Uh, I wanted to change that story and um, with my Batman, I wanted to make it seem where Batman is, you know, Batman's human, right? Like the one thing that always interested me about Batman is the uh, the the event that happened with his parents and how it could uh, psychologically affect him. And so writing the story, I always, I knew that I wanted to go that path. And that's why I feel my Batman's a little bit different than all the other Batmans. <laughs> I love it, and I love that it's getting the attention that it's getting too. And I can see behind you there, you've got the the Batman suit that you yeah. created from scratch for this film too. What went into that? Yeah, so um, I guess I I don't want to I don't want to be copying off off of other directors, and I respect the other directors as 
how they create their own Batman. So I always knew going into this project, I wanted to make my Batman original. So no, I didn't want to buy no replica suit. I wanted to make everything from scratch. So me and my friend who uh, have zero experience making um, uh, costumes, sat down on weeks on weeks on end, just drafting paper, looking at references. Like this Batman suit we referenced, uh, the Christian Bale Batman, the the new Robert Pattinson Batman, as well as the the Arkham Games Batman, and we just, you know, we all we all, I could put put them all together and we created this. I love that. I mean, I love your approach. It's kind of a learn as you go kind of an experience, and maybe that's better anyway because you're likely to come up with something more original. Now, when you're making the suit, though, you, you've got some big fight scenes in the film as well. So how did you get how did you get the suit to make make sure it was going to hold up to those kinds of conditions? Yeah, so the we already knew from the bat uh, right from the start, the um, the suit wasn't going to hold up for any of the fight scenes because it, it was literally just hot glued on and, and we knew that like, any type of like sudden movement will fall apart. So uh, we did a little uh, trickery thing with the filming is uh, all the fight scenes are always filmed on the back side of Batman. So you never get to see the actual armor. So whenever we switch it from the choreographed Batman and to the actor Batman, the actor Batman always had this, the, the armor on. So it looks like, oh, okay, you know, the bat, the, the armor is going to be there. So it was like a little play, a uh, little like play thing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, it just sounds like you went to such great lengths to, to make this happen. And interesting by the end of it, it looks like you've set up a sequel. So will that ever get made, do you think? Yeah, so like um, like you said, like I'm getting so many responses like, oh, is the sequel going to happen? Is, the, you know, the Joker and all that stuff. And yes, I, I'm planning to do a uh, sequel, but right now I'm currently working on my uh, next feature film, which is an original idea of mine. Oh, are you going to give us a little hint? Uh, so growing up, I always loved the uh, the classic American gangster film. So this is my take on a uh, a classic gangster film. So I mean, I don't have any, I don't have a, a title or anything right now. That we're still writing the script, but uh, hopefully by next year, everything will be like set in stone. Okay. Any fight scenes or costumes you're going to need for that? Uh, <laughs> not. We don't have to create another Batman suit. So that's that's the one thing I'm 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 stress free from. Oh, so nice to hear from you. Um, all the best in your future. It sounds as if you're off to a great start. So really nice to talk to you today. Thank you so much, Gloria. This is our Vancouver. Now, the world record holder for the narrowest commercial building is located in Vancouver's Chinatown. The Jack Chow Insurance Building, also known as the Sam Key Building, is only six feet wide. And despite COVID-19 taking a toll on neighboring businesses, owner Rod Chow says the structure is not going anywhere. A spot house is a building or something done to a building that's meant to piss somebody off. My name is Rod Chow, owner of Jack Chow Insurance, which is the skinniest building in the world in the Guinness Book of Records. I'm Eve Lazarus, and I've written a book on Vancouver's hidden history. Chang Toy was a really successful businessman, and he owned the Sam Key Company. And around 1912, the city decided to widen Pender Street. So they came along and they expropriated 24 feet of the 30 feet. So of course, that left Chang Toy with just a sliver of six feet. Back in the olden days, this building housed up to 13 different businesses. So if you look at from the front, it looks like a really big building and there's actually multiple doors. For us as insurance business, we integrated the entire building so that we can actually get from one side to the other through this glass walkway right on the sidewalk. And then you can see the glass staircase inside as well. We actually put that in. That's very unique because the city doesn't actually encourage glass staircases just because of uh, fire hazard. And it goes up into the second level, which each little section is like a bay window. So, uh, but normally with the bay window, you can actually look out a bay window, right? But here, these bay windows, you can actually step out onto them. So that gives a little bit more space upstairs. The extra, extra foot makes a little bit of a difference there. So we have an underground tunnel here under the glass sidewalk where people walk on. People walk above, but if you go underneath, you can actually see people walking above. You can see their feet above you. So that's pretty cool when you're underneath. 
Our theme in the building is mini or skinny. So everything in the building is either skinny or mini. Everything here is skinny right down to the toaster oven. Or the skinny, the skinny toaster oven. The pandemic has really taken its toll on Chinatown. Um, we're seeing above average vacancy rates in Chinatown compared to the rest of the city. Some early numbers from actually mostly outdated numbers from October were showing uh, levels of 18% vacancy. So that means one in every five shops uh, are vacant. I think buildings are so much more than just bricks and mortar. They hold the stories of the Chinese people, they hold the stories of indigenous people, of the black community, of legendary women that tend to get passed over in traditional history books. And I think when we've got the physical presence of the history, that, you know, of the building with the history in it that we can go and see and touch and experience, then it just becomes new for a whole new generation of people. You know, in the long term, I'm not worried about Chinatown as a neighborhood, you know, there's going to be continued to be economic development. But, you know, is there still going to be that cultural character for the neighborhood? Is it going to be the same as how we understand it? It's going to change, absolutely. But can we, is there aspects of it that we want to maintain and conserve? And those legacy businesses are a critical part of that. We hope that the Chinatown businesses, they will start to open back up again and then we'll have more people come in here and uh, just really enjoy Chinatown the way they should enjoy Chinatown. We're here to stay. All right, it's time for one of our favorite features. This is where we get to showcase some of the photographs that you have sent us, so thank you very much. We'll begin with this one from Bikram Rijal. Sent, he sent us this serene photograph of Lindemann Lake at Chilliwack Lake Provincial Park. I just love that clear, clear water, just beautiful. And Britt Swoveland captured the purple camas field in full bloom at Uplands Park in Oak Bay. Wow, thank you so much for that one. Isn't it a gorgeous time of year? And Richard Topping usually sends us photos of eagles and hawks, and we have featured a number of them on this program. Well, this week, he spotted a white-crowned sparrow at the Finn Slough in Richmond. Thank you so much, Richard, for sharing. And do send us more. It's easy. Just choose some of your favorite photographs and email them to us. bcphotos at cbc.ca. bcphotos at cbc.ca. Now, you may have seen this while out for a walk or a run, perhaps in the park, maybe along the beach. Catwalking. Yes, catwalking appears to be growing in popularity. And some say it's good for a pet's health. But as Liam Britton reports, others think that putting a leash on whiskers isn't a good idea. When Haley Vendiola takes Reinhardt for a walk, people tend to notice. A lot of people think he's quite brave looking or quite fierce, but he's actually a really big scaredy cat, which is really funny. Vendiola and Reinhardt are part of what seems to be a growing trend, catwalking. More cat owners are seeking ways to enrich the lives of their pets while not letting them roam free outdoors. He loves to watch the birds, he loves to watch the squirrels. Um, so he does get a chance to sort of get those hunting instincts out, but without us having to worry about him actually killing anything. Cats like Reinhardt are stars of the park and on social media. He has about 180,000 followers on Instagram. But some say catwalking's growing popularity is a problem. A lot of people see these adventure cats on social media and they think, oh, it would be really cool to get a photo of my cat out in the wild. Vokra, the Vancouver Orphan Kitten Rescue Association, adopts out cats and helps find missing ones. We've seen many instances with cats that uh, have been leash walk or taken out in their carriers where they've gotten frightened and they've slipped through their harness. It can happen in an instant and it happens quite frequently. Most of the time we never find them again or if we do, it's really in sad circumstances where we only find a part of the cat. Bukovnik says anyone seeking outdoor exposure for their cat should consider a window or balcony enclosure, a so-called catio instead. Veterinarian Dr. Claudia Richter is a specialist in cat behavior, and she believes catwalking can be done safely if it's done right, and it can have benefits. There's just watching wildlife, there's hunting, there's other cats around. Um, that's a lot of stimulation versus when we put them into the house, most, a lot of our house cats are understimulated. And I do see this as a, as a source of behavior problems, such as like peeing in the house, anxiety disorders, things like that. She says anyone considering catwalking needs to make sure they have the right equipment, like a harness and a backpack the cat can be put into if it's feeling unsafe. They also need to make sure the cat has its shots up to date and has a microchip and tattoo and 
the cat needs to be willing. If you have a cat that's really, really fearful of people and you're going to go and walk around the street where there's lots of people, maybe that's not the best idea. Cat walking may look easy, but for the unprepared it can end badly and be just as difficult as hurting some kind of animal that normally doesn't like to be herded. Liam Britton, CBC News, Vancouver. Coming up, Johanna Wagstaff will be here to give us a preview of this year's hurricane season. to 20 named storms where the average is 14, six to 10 hurricanes and the average is seven and um, three to five major hurricanes uh, where the average is three. So that was the update from the Canadian Hurricane Center for the 2021 season ahead. And it looks like it will be a busy one for the Atlantic Basin. This comes on the heels, of course, of the most active hurricane season ever on record last year. Now, typically 34% of named storms or four on average find their way into Canadian waters. So with more storms predicted, there's a pretty strong chance that we might see a few more storms than usual up in Atlantic Canada. The Royal Meteorological Organization has already issued the list of hurricane names for 2021 from a list that's rotated every six years. I find naming storms just as fascinating, by the way. The first named storm of 2021 was Anna, which formed in mid-May over a month before the official start of the season, which is June 30th. Also this year, a new supplemental list of names has been put in place for the first time in the event they run out of names. On previous rare occasions, like last year, when the main list was used up, the Greek alphabet was used. When a storm causes severe damage or loss of life, the World Meteorological Organization also retires the names and replaces it on that six-year rotating list with another name. The name Dorian, for example, was retired after the storm wreaked havoc from the Bahamas to Nova Scotia in 2019. So no more Dorian. Now, there are often clues as to what kind of season ahead we'll have. And this year, it does look like we've got dramatically warmer waters once again that's upping that forecast. The other factor is wind shear. La Nina, which is a phenomenon in place last year, usually means less wind shear. This year, we're in neutral, so it's hard to say if the Achilles heel will be present for the storms or not. And climate change is an area that we're making more and more connections to with hurricanes. But we know that they're stronger, they're rapidly intensifying, they're taking longer to dissipate on land, they're getting caught up in blocked patterns, and the impacts from them, like storm surge and rain, are becoming greater because of climate change. We just don't have enough data to say if we're seeing more of them yet. But climate change does mean that parts of Canada will need to prepare for stronger hurricanes this year and in the years to come. And now you're science smart. If you have a science question on your mind, send me a tweet and I'll try to get it answered. Thank you so much, Johanna. You are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now we've heard about a lot of people learning to bake bread during the pandemic, but for our next guest, his family's dumpling recipe is what has been in demand. And Raymond Leans is going to be showing people how to make those dumplings on Zoom through the Vancouver business in my kitchen. Raymond, hello there. Hi, Gloria. Nice to see you so, on Zoom. So or, good to see Through the camera. <laughs> through the camera, the next best thing to being there, exactly. Now, why, why did you want to show people how to make dumplings? Well, you know, my family came to Canada in the 70s. And I think, you know, what we take with us along, you know, the trip is very few things. And one of the things is recipes. And, you know, during the pandemic, the nieces and nephews, you know, reached out to me because, you know, what we take along is stories and recipes. And what is the best way to, you know, pass on a legacy along with stories is, is to learn family recipes. And my nieces and nephews, you know, don't have these recipes with them since my parents are gone. So they reach out to me and what is the best way to pass along these stories along with cooking lessons? So that's what we've done. We just, we just do that. You know, we, we share stories along with cooking lessons. And that's what solidified this, this, this with me. Okay, but there is something about biting into a dumpling that is so amazingly satisfying on so many lever levels. There's 
taste, texture, that type of thing. What, what's your approach to the, the perfect dumpling? Well, to me, the perfect dumpling has to do with the dough. And yes, you can buy them, but there's something gratifying about making the dough yourself, right? And, and I think learning how to make the perfect dough is, is, is the secret to a really, really good dumpling. And, and you know, in, in this recipe, you learn how to make that. And, and the dough, you know, it, it, it just, you know, the right to the right texture, learning how to roll it. And, and that, that gratifying, you know, to and that, that give and learning how to cook them along with the family stories that go along. My aunt used to tell me, I used to follow her in the kitchen with a notebook and a pen. And she used to tell me that, you know, if you study too much, your cooking will taste awful. And, and I used to laugh. I didn't understand what that meant. And she said, basically, you learn to cook with, with taste. And Jan Wong actually wrote about it, right? And, and, and Kim Tree also wrote about it in, in the numerous books that she wrote in Montreal. She said, you learn to fry fish by listening to the sound. And, 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 and that, that's what you have to do. You can't just learn by cooking or just thinking about it. You have to taste, you have to, 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 to listen, you have to taste your dressing before you mix it into the salad. And, and that's what cooking is about. You don't just sit there with a thermometer and, 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 and measure and, 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 and you have to smell, you have to taste. And that's what to me is the joy of cooking. It's not so much about measuring and, and thinking and, and that's and that's what my aunt used to tell me but I didn't know what she meant. <laughs> I love the family connections here, I really do. So what have you got in front of you there on the table? What 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 do you use for a filling? Well, what I use for filling is actually, I, I like the simple approach of cooking, which means that, you know, I try to cook without using any measurements, you know, so, but, but since I, I, I teach to my nieces and nephews, you know, they, they keep asking for measurements, so I, but I try to tell them to not go that route. So this simple recipe asks for simple portions of uh, ground pork, uh, prawns, and chives, so equal proportions of fat. And then one tea, and then just a teaspoon of um, simple fish sauce and uh, salt and pepper. But try to taste that mixture first to see if it's pleasant to the taste before you pour it into the mixture. And mix everything by hand. The secret is actually you have to have that mixture by hand. Oh yeah, and chop the chives first. I have some chives here. And you want to mince it like you mince onions. And what you have is the mixture like this. And then, you know, and the secret to this is actually you want to mix everything so that it, it has the consistency of a meatball, of a tight, tight meatball. And then, and, and then that, that's, where, that's where you start. And, and what you have is, is the meatball. Now, the secret to Southeast Asian meatball, as opposed to Western meatballs, that Western meatball, they want it loose. But Southeast Asian meatballs is that you want it to have a bounce. Actually, if you see a Southeast Asian meatball, is that if you take it and you throw it on the floor, it actually bounces back like a rubber ball. <laughs> You're not and suggesting people secret. throw their food around their kitchen, are they, are you? <laughs> Well, for a test. It's just like the spaghetti to the ceiling, you know? You have to do that for a test. And that's the secret to a good meatball. If it doesn't bounce, it's not good for the hot pot. <laughs> so. Okay, now why don't you give us a, a look at some of the finished products there? And when we look at the, at the finished dumplings, how do you make sure they're going to, they're going to stay together? They're not going to fall apart? Ah, now... A good dough, you don't even need to seal it with water. So, so I have some, some dough that is already rolled out. And, and see, they're so good that they actually stuck together. So I'm just going to try to pry them apart. So a good dough, after you roll it, you know, and don't worry about perfection. Because if it's not round, you just stretch it apart. Mm -hmm. So until it's round. And, and it's so... Um, forgiving, you know, and, and after you roll it, it, you just stretch it until you get the desired shape that you want. And just fill about, yay, about this much to the dumpling, put it in the center. After you've made sure it's going to bounce off the floor take... or the cupboards. Okay, we get it. <laughs> 
No, after it's cooked. After oh, it's cooked, cooked, not when it's raw. Okay. 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 So, so yeah, 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 yeah. This is not going to bounce anywhere. Okay. So, so then you just pinch it, pinch it in the center. Okay, and then you're going to fold one side in. One, two. Can we get maybe close in on that? Folds. I want to see that dumpling up close. There we go. There we go. Okay. That's great. Okay, okay I see. So three folds to one side, and then maybe three folds to this side. And then what you get is this. And then you see it's actually very, it's very forgiving. If it's not perfect the first time, just practice. That you is know? a gorgeous dumpling. And what you dumpling. get. Yep, okay. And what you get is this. Right? Mm -hmm. And, and you know, if it's not uniform, don't worry, because you're not a factory, you know? <laughs> <laughs> just thinking back on your just aunt. Just go, go by touch, go by feel, go by taste. We're, we're hearing you. Now, it's interesting, Raymond, you're, you're um, deciding to give partial proceeds of this, of this to the Pacific Canada Heritage Center. Why is that? Well, because our history is not really recorded, you know, and judging from the story that I saw on BC, CBC recently, you know, about the children at North Strathcona School, our history is completely erased, you know, the history of Chinese people building the railroad is just anecdotal, and the person that's name that you see everywhere is Lord Strathcona, who just rode, who just drove in the, the last bike. I mean, hello. <laughs> so that this history of migration and our people needs to be more recognized. So the history of migration and our people, the Asian, you know, Pacific and Pacific people in Canada needs to be more recognize and looking at the devastation of the, of the merchants in, in, in Chinatown. I just, you know, thought that this would be a good opportunity for me and my family as refugees to Canada. And, and, and you know, and I just thought this is, you know, all the dots are connected. So I just want to do this as an effort to, 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 to highlight all of those and give partial proceeds to the Museum of Migration and, and to highlight this and to applaud the, the students at, at, at that school for their efforts, you know, to recognize all these dots, you know, in, in, in light of Asian Heritage Month to put all of this together. Well, Raymond, there's a lot of symbolism in your dumplings and they look delicious. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gloria, for having me. This is our Vancouver. When the turtle turns a hundred years old, you must cross a hundred seas to make it to the party. A lot of events have been cancelled or gone online during the pandemic. The Vancouver International Children's Festival is one of them. Featured shows include high-energy street dance from the group Immigrant Lessons, uh, a nerd's whirlwind musical tour with Indigenous cellist Chris Dirksen, and a film theatre hybrid by the group of storytellers known as One of a Kind. If you'd like more information, go to childrensfestival.ca. The internationally renowned Go Ballet is taking their latest show online for two weeks in June. Their youth company and professional division are still going to perform classical repertoire, Chinese traditional dance, and contemporary works. For more information, just go to thedancecenter.ca. Hey, it's Grant Lawrence here from CBC Music with an awesome new feel-good hit from Mother Mother that has already hit number one on the CBC Music Top 20. I'll share that tune with you in a bit, but first, it was back in 2005 when this quirky, harmony-driven indie rock band first emerged from the rural hippie haven of Quadra Island, BC. Back then, they were simply called Mother, but after running into a couple of other bands of the same name, they officially changed their name to Mother Mother, and they have never looked back, cranking out alt-rock hit after hit ever since. Tell me up here. Okay, it's everyone here. You mean just all of the people? Yeah, and all of their peers. 
ears and all of their pets and the chandeliers and the cigarettes. I haven't smoked in years. And she's better than the drugs I used to love. You got dreams, you got dreams, you got dreams, you got dreams. And you want to set them free, man, but you're stuck there underneath them. So get out. There you go, those are just a few of Mother Mother's top 10 singles from the past several years. Now you may recall late last year, this story emerging. While laying low during COVID, Mother Mother received the surprising news that some of their earliest songs had suddenly become viral sensations on the social media app, TikTok. Thanks to fan-made video clips, which led to a huge upswing in the band's social media numbers and plays across the board. Mother Mother didn't even have to leave their respective apartments. This song dates back to 2009, but it became a viral hit on TikTok in 2020. That's Mother Mother with Hayloft, and since taking off on TikTok, the official video for that song has been viewed over 10 million times. This year, Mother Mother has used their time off the road to create their eighth studio album, fittingly called Inside. For the first single entitled I Got Love, Mother Mother invited their fans to submit their own videos dancing and singing along to the song and sharing whatever they have love for, edited into a TikTok inspired video. There you go, that's Mother Mother with their latest single, I Got Love. And as I mentioned, it's already hit number one on your CBC Music Top 20. And that's the tune that you need to add to your personal inspiration playlist for this week. I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music. Thanks a lot to Maya Ford from the Donnas for the shirt. And speaking of inspiration, I'll leave you this week with this amazing Mother Mother fan. Hi, Mother Mother. As you can see here, I have stomach scars as a result from my birth, and I never learned how to love them. So, uh, I listened to your song and I realized how unique these are to me. So, I made this little sign that says, I got love for my stomach scars, which is true. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And coming up, remembering Cornelia Oberlander, the late landscape architecture icon who helped shape many of Vancouver's public spaces. Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, Cornelia Oberlander might not be a name that you recognize right away, but anyone who has been to Vancouver definitely would recognize her contributions. The 99-year-old died this month, and as Eva Yuguin Senge tells us, her work defined Vancouver green spaces. You probably can't imagine Vancouver beaches without them, but once upon a time, these washed up logs were burned until Cornelia Oberlander stepped in. She saw them being burned and she said, why don't we put them on the beach and people can use them to sit on them. And so uh, she's just 
really in so many ways made this city a better place. The pioneer in landscape architecture died just days after Vancouver City Council gave her the Freedom of the City Award. In a statement, Vancouver Mayor Kennedy Stewart said Oberlander was one of Vancouver's most renowned Jewish residents. And during Jewish Heritage Month this May, we honor her outstanding accomplishments in bringing world-class landscape design to Canada and to Vancouver in particular. We are more than beavers and mounties. We have produced wonderful architecture in the 20th century. Oberlander fled Nazi Germany at 18 years old. She settled in Vancouver in 1953 after graduating from Harvard. She was in the second cohort of women allowed to enter the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University. And almost none of her female cohorts graduated. She did. Using logs as natural seating wasn't the only way Oberlander left her mark on the city of Vancouver. Her contributions include Robson Square, the Vancouver Public Library Central Branch Rooftop Garden, and landscaping for UBC's Museum of Anthropology. But her impact stretched out beyond the city. She ended up building and designing uh, Expo 67, the Creative Play Centre and the Outdoor Play Centre there. In fact, I still run into adults today who talk about playing in that landscape in 1967. In 2018, Oberlander was awarded the Order of Canada. Harrington says the past year is a testament to the importance of her work. It took a pandemic, but also we realized, yeah, we, we need these spaces and they're good for us. <laughs> and she knew that. She knew that when she moved here in 1953. I think she was really inspired by the lands, the existing landscape that was here. A landscape that inspired Oberlander to cement Vancouver's reputation as a green city for generations to come. Eva Yuguen Senj, CBC News, Vancouver. When the head of Canada's largest cryptocurrency exchange reportedly died in 2019, it left more than a quarter of a billion dollars of customers' funds in limbo. While authorities investigated, one online sleuth decided to dig deeper to find the money. And that is the subject of a new CBC podcast. It's called A Death in Crypto Land. Here's the trailer. So he goes to India and they stay at this beautiful hotel. As soon as they check in, gelled cotton gets a stomach ache. And the next day he's dead. Gerald Cotton died in India on December 9th. Since then, Quadriga, his Vancouver-born company, has been in turmoil. More than $250 million of client money is missing. From CBC Podcasts, a death in Cryptoland, the curious tale of Gerald Cotton. You know, I wasn't really buying the headline, crypto CEO dies with keys to the wallet. The exchanges just don't operate that way. A young man who built a cryptocurrency empire. I think a lot of people trusted him because he was this sort of pleasant, friendly, smiling guy with this, you know, sunshine, blonde hair. And died under mysterious circumstances. I said, Jerry Cotton is dead. And he goes, that's crazy. And then he goes, what if he's not really dead? Honeymoon, moving the body, like all the missing money. It was like, but what happened? There are deep oddities in this case. Does somebody who appears to be in reasonable health, who is young, do they die that quickly? He spent millions of dollars buying cars, a yacht, an airplane, you know, going on these lavish vacations. He was just sort of out of control. You steal $4,000, no one's going to come looking for you. You steal a few hundred million, they will look for you unless they think you're dead. I'm Takara Small, and this is A Death in Cryptoland. Coming soon on CBC Listen and everywhere you get your podcasts. Exhume the body and frickin' check the DNA. So we can all sit there and go, okay, yeah, he's dead. Well, no, he's not dead. Well, let's go find him. Coming up. For more than 70 years, people flocked to the bowling alley at Surrey's Clover Lanes. Well, now a new owner hopes that people will keep coming when it returns as a church.
Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now for 72 years, Surrey's Clover Lanes has been a much loved landmark in the community. And it was also one of the few remaining bowling alleys in the area. But last month, COVID forced it to close its doors. And as Zara Premji tells us, it will be reopening in a few months with a new purpose. Very sad that COVID could bring such devastating trauma. Before the pandemic shuttered the iconic Clover Lane's five pin bowling alley, it was a hub for celebrations. <laughs> Birthdays, wedding parties and other family get togethers. The alley was a meeting place for so many. People that you don't see other than when you come down here and that, so you're excited. Well, what did you do all week? In 1949, it first opened its doors to the Surrey community. Tucked away between a neighborhood corner store and the police station, a destination inside a quiet residential neighborhood. This place turned into a landmark over its 72 years, leaving a lasting impact on just about anyone who laced up at the lanes. It was a, a place that you looked so forward to the new week coming. At times, I bowled as at least three times a week. But the iconic lanes couldn't survive the economic downturn brought on by the pandemic. COVID hit and it took every breath of our business and it left the business to ashes. The alley has gone through many hands over the years. The last owners bought it three years ago and intended to keep it for decades to come. Maybe my grandson would have taken over. However, COVID-19 was a strike they didn't see coming, but the decision to sell wasn't made lightly. But we also made a very deliberate choice to make sure that we gave it to somebody that would also continue to serve the, the community in such hard time. Going from a site of sports pilgrimage to a more religious calling. We come here to give them a place of worship, uh, a youth uh, development center, uh, children's ministry place and then also a soup kitchen and also a food bank. So come September this bowling alley will be reborn when the Clover Lane sign comes down and the Church of Pentecost Canada sign goes up. We're here with good good reasons and good intentions. And while this won't be a bowling alley anymore they hope to remain a pin in the Cloverdale community. Zara Premji, CBC News, Surrey. You know, it's a common problem this time of year. Urban geese nesting in odd places like the ledge of a Vancouver building. And this has prompted some nearby residents to come up with a rescue plan to get the gaggle back into the wild. Just watch. A group of Vancouver residents rescued this gaggle of geese from a two-story building. The geese needed help getting their goslings back down to the ground. While some of the goslings managed to jump off the ledge, a few of them stayed behind. Residents who lived across from the building kept an eye on the geese and called the Wildlife Rescue Association to safely rescue them. They know what to do if the animal's injured. They know what to do if the animals are, they let the wildlife rescue take care of the animals and decide what's best for them. The geese were eventually relocated to Stanley Park and released into the wild. CBC Vancouver is so lucky to have award-winning photographer Ben Nelms on staff. Here are a few images of the week we had, captured in only the way Ben can. And that's all for our Vancouver for this week. I hope you can join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio 1 for On the Coast. Bye-bye for now.